Having discussed the, the general principles, I'd like now to um, turn to one of the um, one of the common uh, clinical challenges which we face, which we could um, we could label a calibration issue or a calibration challenge, and that's known as the false air bone gap. So, when we perform air and bone conducted pure tone audiometry, then we know as audiologists that some air bone gap is inevitable even in patients who are either normally hearing or with a hearing loss that's sensory neural but no reason at all to think that they have um, a, conductive, um, a conductive component. And the reason for this is because when we do air conduction and then do bone conduction there is a variability in the thresholds that we measure which will act independently between these two different measurements, air and bone. So this is why for example um, looking at the 500 hertz threshold that I'm showing here on this audiogram that there's a small difference between the bone conducted sound as dis displayed by the green symbol and the air conducted sound as displayed by the red symbol and uh, this type of small variance is, isn't to be uh, of course over interpreted as, as evidence of, of a conductive loss but what I, what I want to draw your attention to is that uh, this challenge which we quite frequently observe in the clinic of somewhat larger air bone gaps particularly in the high frequencies for bone conduction 3 kilohertz and 4 kilohertz which can appear where one wouldn't intuitively expect um, a conductive loss to be manifest and uh, particularly with normal TIMPs um, normal uh, visual observation by otoscopy and no evidence to think that in fact there is any type of conductive loss in that patient and advice is being that these um, these excessive air bone gaps that are isolated to the high frequencies and are hard to explain clinically in fact they they may be caused by airborne radiation from the bone vibrator um, which can then um, uh, which can then propagate down the ear canal and then be heard by the air conducted route and this is thought to be a particular problem at three and four kilohertz and so the advice has been well in that case just plug with a piece of foam the ear canal but then what can commonly happen of course is that once the ear is plugged um, and one follows these procedures then quite frequently it doesn't seem to have much of an effect at all the air the apparent air bone gap remains and so it isn't that this that the, there isn't any airborne radiation that's not really what we think is the problem but rather if the reference equivalent threshold force levels were calculated on a group of normally hearing young adults who themselves had their ears plugged at 3 and 4 kilohertz when measuring bone conduction then the effect of any airborne radiation should be cancelled out so that's potentially or well, the most likely reason why we, we don't see any effect of plugging so in that case what might be the explanation well I will just refer you to this uh, fascinating study by Margolis and others in in 2013 which has really helped shed a lot of light on on the uh, on the situation and um, what these uh, what these audiologists did was they showed um, the way in which the reference equivalent threshold force levels drop in um, in a linear way as we increase in uh, frequency so I'm showing here on the right side of the uh, chart um, uh, the, the, the frequencies on the x-axis and then the reference equivalent threshold force levels as published in the ISO standard on the y-axis and we can see that from a low frequency up to 2 kilohertz then a line of best fit shows uh, a very in, a neat um, pattern of uh, the, the, uh, the threshold reference threshold force levels dropping at a rate of about 12 dB per octave but then when we get to the high frequencies three and four kilohertz all of a sudden the pattern um, suddenly deviates in a way that makes it look like the reference equivalent threshold force levels are higher than what they should be and if they're higher than what they should be in other words the output is higher then that would explain the bone conducted thresholds looking slightly better than the air conducted thresholds the false air bone gap and what this study did here Margolis and others what they did was to test um, a large sample of uh, normally hearing and then sensory neural hearing loss patients with no real reason at all to think that they would have any conductive loss 
And what they found was um, a series of either no, no or very minimal air bone gaps um, as what you might expect with a small independent variation of air and bone conducted sounds at frequencies up to 2 kilohertz. But when they looked at 4 kilohertz, they found a consistent air bone gap of 14.1 dB. So as I say, even though they had no reason to suspect a middle ear conductive disorder. So if this 14.1 dB is subtracted from the reference equivalent threshold force level, then it falls much closer to the line of best fit, or the extrapolated line of best fit. So it seems as though there's a, a, an error in the reference equivalent threshold force level. They, they didn't check 3 kilohertz, they didn't have enough data to show that, but it's probably the case at 3 kilohertz too. Okay, so what else can we talk about? Well, um, there is, of course, the uh, consideration of ambient noise and the testing environment, particularly for sound field, um, sound field testing. There is um, a very important consideration, which we're going to unpack in more detail shortly, uh, that of um, correct calibration of short duration stimuli clicks, tone bursts and chirps, and this is important because of the extensive applications in evoke potentials, wideband tympanometry, um, and OAEs. Of course, tympanometry, so it's not just audiological audiometry that we have to calibrate the instruments for, but others. Uh, so tympanometry, in some ways we've learned uh, something of the principles because we, we know that the um, tympanometry, uh, traditional tympanometry, emits a pure tone stimulus, 226 hertz, 1000 hertz, etc and we know how to calibrate that sound. It's not just that uh, there's this pure tones, there's also the pump and the microphone that would be calibrated. Sound field, uh, well here we have um, again a series of reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels available for different incidences um, like straight ahead, uh, uh, off, to, off to one side or, or another. Um, and uh, so there's some differences there in the approach and of course the different types of sound warble tones are typically used to prevent um, standing waves from forming and then also we would typically use a different microphone as attached to the SLM than the ones that we might use in the coupler but in principle we can um, we, we, the information that we've learned so far is very transferable to these different applications except for short duration stimuli where there's a marked difference in the approach so I'm going to just unpack that uh, in some detail now. So when it comes to sound level meters many sounds measured by an SLM commonly fluctuate so speech sounds and other environmental sounds not incidentally so much the pure tones that we've been discussing so far they're a very stable and e relatively easy to measure signal but many of the other types of signals that an SLM might be expected to, to uh, measure uh, fluctuate. And what the instruments do therefore is they produce or they average over some period of time the input to produce a more stable reading. And sometimes this averaging period, and which you can see from the circuit diagram, goes on quite, uh, uh, quite an advanced point in the diagram, is sometimes described as the, the integration time for the instrument. And so here we can see on the green line in the middle of the uh, screen, we can see a, a hypothetical sound stimulus that fluctuates uh, quite a lot in time. But the reading on the sound level meter is much more stable. That's the yellow hashed line, and that's because of the averaging window. And there are two uh, commonly used averaging windows or an integration period. There's the fast period with um, an averaging of uh, over 125 milliseconds or there's the slow period over one second. But we have a challenge when it comes to the transient signals um, which we're interested in for many audiological tests, evoke potentials and so on, because many transient signals are much shorter than even the minimum 125 millisecond integration period that I've described here. So for example, these clicks, tone bursts, and chirps of various different types that are commonly used. And so if the, if, the sig if the signal is much shorter than the integration time, then the sound level meter will likely underestimate the true level of that signal. And that, that effect is displayed here. So here we have on the 
on the uh, x-axis the time or the duration of the signal and on the the y-axis uh, um, how much of an underestimation that might be relative to um, a continuous signal and we can see that as the stimulus um, gets shorter or indeed as the integration time is um, more and more uh, unfilled then uh, the, the underestimation of the level gets greater and greater. And this has some analogy to the way in which uh, human hearing works. So audiologists might well be familiar with the way in which um, normal hearing individuals, you could take a normal hearing adult and play a transient signal in their ear, such as a high intensity click, as might commonly be used in VEMPs, for example. Take a, a 90 or a 95 or even a 100 dB NHL, um, signal like that, play it into a normally hearing adult's ear and they could quite commonly tolerate that, so that sound without any clear discomfort. But if you take the same sound, very short duration click, and now start to increase its duration but, take, but keep the intensity the same, so then that click would then turn into um, a, a broadband noise, um, then quickly um, anything up to about 200 milliseconds or so um, for the, the integration period for the human ear um, it, the, the loudness would increase even though you haven't uh, changed the, the intensity until it would quite quickly become uh, difficult for that person to tolerate. So if we can't measure directly um, then what, what solutions, what, op what alternatives do we have available? Well the, probably the most common alternative is known as the peak-to-peak -peak equivalent sound pressure level. And so here what we do is we take a stable stimulus that can be measured um, in the sound level meter accurately. For example, a 1 kilohertz pure tone. And here we have a 1 kilohertz pure tone that we've played into the sound level meter and it's an insert phone, so we're using the 2cc coupler. And we measure that and here we have 100 dB SPL. Now we take the AC output from the sound level meter, um, capture that via an oscilloscope and visualize the peak-to-peak uh, -peak voltage of the, the waveform. And that steady, that steady state information from the pure tone, so that can be both visualized on the oscilloscope and captured accurately by the sound level meter, can then be compared to um, a transient that can be captured electroacoustically by the oscilloscope but not measured accurately by the sound level meter. So for example we might take a chirp. We would ignore any information on the screen of the sound level meter. Now we would have a look at the electroacoustic um, transient on the, on, the, uh, on the oscilloscope and we would increase the level until we matched it to the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the known or reference level. And here we have, for example, a chirp that's been calibrated now to 100 dB peak equivalent SPL. Okay, so an audiological instrument calibrated to a reference threshold using the peak equivalent SPL or peak-to-peak peak peak equivalent, I should correctly say, but often abbreviated just to peak equivalent, um, that method would be denoted by the use of this NHL. Now traditionally, this is an important point here, uh, traditionally NHL meant that references were being used, reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels were being used that hadn't in fact been published in international standards, so maybe locally derived um, references. But what we have here for a series of transients that are in common use, tone bursts, clicks and so on, is an international standard 389.6. And so that means that in theory we shouldn't be using the, the, um, uh, the, the label NHL, we should be using HL. So it's slightly incorrectly labeled as something of a hangover from a time where these international standards weren't available. But now of course having continued in the use of NHL somewhat inappropriately then at least it gives us with a, a, an easy distinction to show that we're talking about um, a stimulus of very short duration lower than 50 milliseconds is what I've put here just as a rule of thumb now some transient signals that we also use in evoke potentials are actually longer than 50 milliseconds 
for example commonly used slightly longer duration signals for um, N1P2 cortical evoke potentials, auditory late responses um, and so on. And in these cases they can be calibrated and then referenced to normal pure tone reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels. So in these cases the uh, the usual dbhl label is is indeed used for the for these sounds now they might in many cases be shorter than the 125 millisecond integration time of the fast um uh, sound level meter circuit um and so they may still be uh measured in the peak equivalent spl method but then referenced to to um the normal pure tone reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level um, so there might be a small integration time error, perhaps negligible, um, but, th but that's uh, commonly what happens. Okay, now moving our discussion on to some clinical considerations, um, I would like to discuss some correction factors since we're talking about um, a transient signals and evoke potentials, correction factors that can move us from um, stimuli represented in NHL for short duration sounds to uh, stimuli or thresholds as to what they would have been in EHL if we could have measured a long duration sound, a pure, a standard pure tone. And this is absolutely critical because um, the predictive relationship of uh, auditory brainstem responses and, and other evoke potentials working as surrogates for when pure tone audiometry isn't available or isn't appropriate, um, well that depends not only of course on accurate calibration in the first place, but also on, on these correction factors because there may well be a difference between the behavioral threshold NHL for a short duration sound and the behavioral threshold HL or estimated behavioral threshold EHL for a longer duration pure tone sounds and th these physiological or inherent uh, differences um, it can be thought of as perhaps I guess the consequence of um, difference in the neural uh, temporal integration between short and long duration sounds and also perhaps because the ABR at some point near threshold becomes so tiny that it can't be recognized um, above the noise floor of the, of the test and that's what we can kind of see here in the schematic on the left of an ABR that's very clear for the uh, 60 dB NHL smaller and smaller as we turn the volume down until below 20 it's, it's, not, it's not apparent anymore so that's one part of the correction factor but a second part is the transducer specific part and um, that part there is, is age specific. Remember the, the primary application here is, is in the neonatal period if we're talking about um, evoke potentials for threshold estimation. So let's just think a little bit more about those transducer specific considerations of calibration. So now remember, um, when we uh, when we have an insert phone calibrated, then we um, we use uh, a two cc coupler, which is meant to represent the residual ear canal volume of an adult. But then what we do routinely using this test is we place the sponge in the ear canal of an infant, perhaps some uh, a newborn in the neonatal period. And so what we have there for the same output of the transducer now, a much smaller residual ear canal volume. And so it's, much like, it's very likely to lead to a greater uh, physical intensity of, of the stimulus. And so the sound pressure level that we actually might achieve at the eardrum will vary, not just because of the smaller volume of the patients, the newborns, but potentially also variable because of um, insertion depth differences from one patient to another, changes of course in the ear canal volume with growth or again from one patient to another, um, potentially any middle ear disorders that might change the acoustic or middle ear compliance and um, potentially any sound leakages. But we can expect um, that the uplift, the greater, in the, the increase in intensity in an a neonatal using an insert might be as around 15 dB. Similar in principle, this uplift to the difference between adult and infant really to a couple of differences, which I'll touch on later. But from a practical point of view, because of this uplift, then um, stimuli calibrated in dB NHL on the dial should never exceed 85 dB NHL with inserts when we're talking about using those sounds in the infants in the neonatal period because of that known uplift. 
what about so that's inserts what about the superoral which again may well be used for the same type of um, the, the same type of uh, application well here in the 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 the, uh, the, the superoral might almost completely encapsulate the, uh, the the newborn pinna so the residual ear canal volume that's uh, enclosed by that transducer um, is proportionally perhaps closer to the adult test uh, volume and so we'd expect or we might well expect less uplift to begin with but also because we're positioning the um, the transducer over the top of the pinna as opposed to inserting a sponge inside the ear canal then we're not going to get any insertion depth issues and so it might be that we produce somewhat less intersubject variability that's not to mention anything to do with leakages um, of sound uh, for an ill-fitting transducer on the side of the patient's head the baby's head um, but there are um, definitely a couple of issues there which are vary as, as compared with um, the, the, the inserts Before uh, we move on that discussion, I'll just briefly, as an aside, mention uh, uplift issues in the neonates using the bone transducer. So in the top panel here, we have um, a schematic of the adult cranium. And what, what, what we can see is, from the top right uh, panel, the top down view of the adult cranium, is uh, it should be very easy to see there that the plates of the cranium are tightly knitted together so that when we place the bone transducer on the side on one mastoid or the other it's very easy for the sound vibrations to propagate from uh, the different parts of the cranium now if we refer to the lower panels a schematic of the infant skull then the red regions represent um, the fibrous cartilaginous tissue that connects the um, the the uh, underdeveloped plates of the infant cranium so the the plates are, are disconnected to some extent and this is very important as it allows the plates of the skull to slip and slide and move to some extent with relation to one another um, when the baby passes through the, the, the mother's birth canal. And this is important because as a species we have a large cranial capacity and as a bipedal upright species then we're relatively narrow uh, pelvis and so the birthing procedure is, is uh, often quite a difficult procedure and this movement of the plates of the cranium allows the head to slip through the, the mother's birth canal but from a practical point of view from an audiological point of view um, what this means is that the bone transducer when placed on the infant's mastoid the vibrations are somewhat restricted and isolated to the plate of interest which overall is as a lower mass than that of the, the adults uh, the adults equivalent and so if we take a force that's um, calibrated as if on an adult's head and take that same vibratory force and place it on the smaller bone mass of the infant's head then it, and restrict that to just one of, the one of the plates of the cranium instead of all of them then we'd expect an uplift in the force that can be achieved and um, this is perhaps on the order of some dB, 6 perhaps dB Okay, so here's some uh, discussion so far about variations in the sound pressure level in the small infant ear canal. But in fact, there is some uplift and some variation from one patient to another, even in adults. Now, the residual ear canal volumes for adults are typically lower than the 2cc, 2 cubic centimeter volume of the couplers that we use for calibration it might be somewhere in the range 0 0.65 to you know 1.75 but importantly here not only is it smaller producing some uplift but there's a range that, co that causes variability in what's happening in the real ear SPL for a fixed input signal even in adults from one adult to another and this has been quite um, uh, quite quite neatly um, illustrated by this study here Valente and others in 1994 and what they did was they took t uh, 50 adults uh, they didn't measure their thresholds that's not relevant this is just a physical comparison what they did was they took uh, they, they took a fixed uh, stimulus from an audiogram uh, from, from an audiometer different frequencies and then they measured this the stimulus in SPL in the ear canal and then they had a look how did that vary from one adult to another 
and here we show the results of their study for the four different frequencies. So the blue, or the, the, so the, green, the green circles show for the four different frequencies the, the mean output of those 50 people in SPL, and the yellow hashed uh, lines show the uh, so th show the variance, the one standard deviation. Whereas at the bottom here we show the the complete range for the group in in decibels. So um, different people with slightly different ear canal volumes, um, perhaps different uh, middle ear acoustical properties of um, compliance or impedance um, can show variation for a fixed stimulus level. Another quite elegant way to show this variation is in the rear, real ear to coupler difference. And here's a couple of studies that have looked at this in, in adults. So the variability is what's happening in the real ear sound pressure level for a fixed input signal. And what we do to have a look at this is we can play that fixed input signal to a coupler, a 2cc coupler, play the same um, signal into the real ear, measure that with a probe mic system, and then have a look at what the difference is in SPL. And that's the real ear to coupler difference. And here we have in the right, the bottom right, a very, uh, a very common real ear to coupler difference. So it's a positive value across the frequency range, showing that the real ear measure was higher than the coupler measure for the same stimulus. But importantly, um, the results here in tabulated form um, from uh, that Munro and Davis study in 2003. Just four frequencies are shown, but the full range of frequencies is, is reported by the authors. But what they show is a variation, so we have two standard deviations here and um, different values for, those, for that variation. And that, that variation is what's happening in the real ear for a fixed input signal due to differences in ear canal volumes and acoustic impedances between, uh, between individuals. Now, just as an aside, before we move on to um, the uh, the upshot of all this, which I'm building up to, I would just like to mention um, you may be thinking about other applications where we insert a um, a transducer to the ear, and um, it might be that we have different ear canal volumes for different patients. So, two classic applications where we insert a probe into the ear and have very uh, suffer from the potential effects of variation in different ear canal volumes would be OAEs and tympanometry. But these two procedures um, are self-calibrating in the sense that um, when different patients uh, are tested the SPL is measured individually in for that patient and so is kept at a consistent level via the use of a microphone and feedback loop. So for example if we were to measure DPOAEs when we go to place in the adult ear canal um, two pure tones, one at 65 and one at 54 dB SPL, but then we were to do that same procedure in an infant and a newborn, then the microphone that's incorporated into the probe can self-calibrate so that we would also have a 65 and a 54 dB input um, in those smaller ear canal volumes with no infant uplift. But of course, as you can see, um, this microphone and feedback loop arrangement is what enables this as opposed to just the sponge that might be used in insert headphones um, which, which leads to that calibration or potential calibration error. But anyway, coming back to, to the inserts, I just want to now close the loop of the discussion by um, thinking about, so so far we've talked a lot about diagnostic audiology which discusses or well, it makes heavy use of DBHL scales but when we talk about management via hearing aids, then we very commonly um, refer to sounds as measured in dB SPL. So by having taken the time to think carefully about converting from SPL to HL for diagnostics, then we should also consider how to carefully switch back from HL to SPL for intervention for management with hearing aids. And so here's an example of what I'm talking about. Here we have on the left, um, an audiogram as measured with an insert um, in dBHL. And on the right, and since we have a hearing loss here, then on the right we might think about um, fitting this patient with a hearing aid and using the SPLogram um, uh, checking the output of that hearing aid. So we need to switch these thresholds as measured in HL on the left into SPL on the right. 
and HL to SPL requires reference equivalent threshold sound pressure levels which I'm displaying in this um, equation at the bottom so dBHL now rather than the reference equivalent sound pressure levels I've actually displayed something slightly different something known as the coupler to dial difference it's slightly different correction now the coupler to dial difference and the reference equivalent threshold SPL are very similar values but they're not identical just due to uh, slightly different coupler arrangements but that gets us from HL to SPL then of course we need to consider the fact that um, the individual's ear canal acoustics uh, will also give us a slightly different value in the real ear to the coupler so then we would add on the real ear to coupler difference now that, so that's co to correct for uh, ear canal acoustics but of course here you can see um, that we're using uh, average RECDs and as I've described uh, it might be that this actually introduces an inherent calibration error not only in the threshold but then uh, it, as displayed in SPL but then resulting um, uh, the, the prescription gain targets from the hearing aid would also have that same inherent calibration error and that's because it might be that the individual ear canal acoustics might not be the same as, as the average so the average RECD might not be appropriate and so even though that would create an inherent calibration error we'd have the wrong thresholds and then the wrong prescription target we wouldn't necessarily know so even doing for example a real ear measurement real ear aided response or real ear insertion gain that wouldn't resolve the error so the hearing aid might be meeting the target but the target might be wrong and, and that wouldn't necessarily be apparent to the audiologist so um, another option, um, uh, arguably a more desirable option, would be to measure the RECD and use an individualized RECD. And what that would do is it would account for the individual's ear canal acoustics and give us a very accurate um, uh, derivation of the real ear SPL. So that would be a very refined fitting, especially useful if the individual's ear canal acoustics it was quite clear that it was going to be far from the average RECD so maybe someone with very large or very small ear canal volumes surgical alterations to the to the ear but it, it would still to some extent be useful with with, it, with everyone so having now derived um, accurate thresholds in SPL we can now derive accurate prescription targets and then using um, standard real ear measurements for example aided response or insertion gain we can now calibrate the output of the hearing aid um, in, in the real ear to, uh, to individualize its output um, for, for, uh, to, to that individual and so it might be that you can see that really the what we call verification real ear measures is, is in many respects just a calibration step it's calibrating that, that hearing aid for that individual's ear Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I'll just uh, draw the talk to a close now, and uh, here are some of those. You know, here are those citations that I've um, mentioned through the through the talk, uh, um, and I would just like to close by um, thanking you once again for your continued attention, and um, invite you to uh, to uh, make use of uh, all of our other um, online training materials and products. Thank you.